And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. A child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt this heart of stone As Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed here white as snow. White snow. And when before the throne. I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to sin. My lips shall still repeat. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Praise the one who paid our debt. Oh, praise the one who paid our debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from Amen, church. There's two passages of scripture that really tie you well into that old hymn we just sang together. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come, now let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, 
they shall be as white as snow. They, though they are like red crimson, they shall become like wool. And then in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter wrote, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Church, it's good to honor and worship the Lord. Uh, whether it's through new songs or old songs, we are so grateful for the gift that Jesus offered on our behalf. And this morning, like every Sunday morning, uh, we are gathering online uh, to worship the Lord. And we've done that this morning. We're going to continue to do that. I want to encourage you. Uh, you guys have been so faithful. Uh, you have not only been generous in this season, you have uh, been communicating with us, with your leaders, with your small group leaders. Some of our small groups are still meeting in person. Some are meeting online. And in just a second, we're going to pray over some prayer requests. And I know that the last few months have been difficult. They've been hard. Some of you have never felt more alone. You've got anxiety, fear, all these different things wrestling for your mind. Uh, but I have some good news this morning. Most of you saw in the church communications and emails that went out this week. Uh, we're going to be attempting an outdoor service two weeks from today on June 28th. There's still some details up in the air. More than likely, it'll be at 9 in the morning. Uh, we are hoping and praying the weather cooperates. As we put in the email, we want you to mark your calendars, but with a pencil. Uh, we are hoping and praying that this will work out. I know that most of you are excited. Many of you are still going to worship online, and that's fine. I want you to be safe. I want you to take whatever precaution you may need to. Uh, there's a couple of reasons we've decided to do it this way. When I walk into Lowe's, when I go to the grocery store and I put my mask on, it's really hard for me to read people. It's hard for people to read me. When I communicate and talk with people, I like to smile and laugh, and they can't tell if I'm kidding or not. And so I just don't want our first time back together in months for you to have to deal with a mask in a building. And so if we're outside, we can socially distance. I'm going to encourage you to bring an umbrella or something for shade. Keep the sun off the back of your neck. We're going to try to have it in the front of the property, and all those details will be coming to you, but I'm looking forward to it. I've missed you. I know you've missed seeing one another. And I want to assure you of a couple of things. Uh, it's going to be short. I know that your kids have short attention spans. There's not going to be a nursery or kids ministry that Sunday morning. And this is not something we plan on doing every week for right now. This is going to be something we do. And then the next week we get back online. And so I'm excited about it. I hope the weather cooperates. And uh, I want you to be encouraged. At this time, if you have a prayer request or a praise item, something maybe you've been praying for that God has intervened, maybe something you're still praying and trusting God for, I'm going to invite you to click the link in the description of this video and share with us how we can pray for you, because we're going to pray in just a second, and we've got some needs in our church that we're going to pray over, some individuals that we're praying for, some needs in our community that we're praying over and praying for. And so if you have a need this morning, I want you to be sure to let us know how we can pray for you. So before we sing again, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask him to intervene on our behalf. God, we thank you. We praise you for all that you've done. Before we knew we had a need, you sent Jesus. You rescued us from our sin, from our brokenness. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that you are so good. You're beautiful. You're gracious. You're merciful. You're righteous. You're holy. You're everything that we aren't. You're everything we want to be, Lord. So, God, we come to you this morning. And we acknowledge that we need you. And we need you to intervene on our behalf. There's some people in our church, God, that are praying for jobs. There's some people in our church, Lord, that are praying for people that are close to them that have, Lord, different situations. Some of them have physical needs. Some of them have financial needs. Some of them, Lord, are praying for lost loved ones that you would awaken their need for you during this season. God, I pray right now for every need that's been turned in and maybe the ones that nobody's shared yet. They're keeping it to themselves. They're worried. They're keeping it to themselves. They're praying for something that they don't even know if you are still hearing their prayers. God, I pray this morning that you wouldn't just bless us for our sake, but as we're going to see in the story we read this morning, that you would bless us so that we can be a blessing. You would give us, Lord, not only the needs of our heart, but Lord, when you bless us with gifts and opportunities, we'd not just use them on ourselves. We'd pour them out into the lives that you've placed around us. So God, we're your church. We want to honor you with our lives. We want to honor you with how we react to what's going around, on around us. We want to honor you with how we care for our neighbors during this difficult season. So Lord, we're going to continue worshiping. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
amen. Would you continue singing with us as we worship the Lord this morning in song?
But church, sometimes that's where we find ourselves. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know what to say. We don't know what's next. And all we have left is praise and to worship God. For some of us, that's where we've come to. We've done everything we know to do. In seasons gone by, they've worked out. But in this season, nothing we do seems to fix the issue, the problem, whether it's the issue around us, the issue within us, the issue in our relationship, the issue in our soul. Sometimes there comes a point where all we can do is turn to the Lord. It's actually going to be exactly what we talk about in today's message. Before we jump into the Word, I'd like to pray, and I want to pray for those of you who have come to that point. All you have left is to turn to God. I hope this morning that you would realize that's not a bad place. That's actually sometimes the best place for us. Run out of ideas on our own, run out of options, run out of fixes that we have, and turn to the Lord and say, God, I, I don't know what else to do. There have been a handful of times in my life where I had no answers, I had no fixes, I had no solutions, I had no help, and I had to go to the Lord and say, God, this problem is not going to go away unless you intervene. It's actually in those seasons of my life that I've grown the most and I've seen God do miraculous things, intervene on my behalf and on the behalf of others. So let's pray for that exact thing to happen this morning. Jesus, I don't know the needs. I know a few here and there, but I don't know every need of every heart who's watching this morning, who's joined us for church online. So God, I pray right now that you would intervene on somebody's behalf who has come to the point where they've realized you are all they have left. They can't save themselves. They can't fix themselves. They can't seem to find a solution in themselves or around them. So God, I pray this morning that you would do only what you can. You begin drawing us to this truth that there are, there are just things we can't do. There are things we need your Holy Spirit for. There are things we need your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your freedom for. And so Lord, I pray for every area of my heart that I've tried to fix on my own that Lord, I just need to turn over to you. I pray the same for everybody watching this morning. God, bless the service. Bless as we read your scripture. And I pray this morning that we'd be an encouragement, not only in our church, but to our neighbors, our friends, our fellow co-workers, the people in our community. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I am excited this morning to continue our series of some of the best Bible stories you may or may not have heard. And I'm actually going to share with you a story this morning that has four main characters. And as a matter of fact, what's interesting is we're actually going to read through this story. I'm only going to read a few verses. I'm going to give you the great synopsis of this entire book. And I'm going to tell you a couple of people who aren't going to appear in this story. Jesus doesn't show up on the scene in this book. As a matter of fact, God isn't even mentioned in the book from which I'm going to read you this story. The book of Esther is a story of how God used people, and yet his name doesn't appear. As a matter of fact, the word prayer doesn't appear. There's going to be a mention of fasting, and that is about as spiritual as this story is going to get. But throughout it, you're going to find a few people who depended on the Lord, who had faith in spite of all of the difficult situations around them. And we're going to pick up in Esther. I'm going to tell you what kind of happens throughout the whole book, and I'm going to tell you about four main characters. Obviously, the lady named Esther, most of you know her story. She's married to a guy named Hazarus. Uh, you may know him as Xerxes, all right? Uh, he was in, if you've seen the movie The 300, uh, listen, that's the guy portrayed as the invader. Xerxes the first, a Hazarus in the book of Esther. One of those is his Babylon, I'm sorry, his Persian name. One of those is his Hebrew name, as the Hebrews called him. Same guy. He's the one that Esther would marry. But then you know Esther has a cousin named Mordecai. He's not just a cousin. He's a distant relative who's a little bit older than her, kind of like an uncle who's been taking care of her. And then there's an individual named Haman who we'll get to in just a second. But throughout this story, these four characters are going to enter into the scene. And obviously Xerxes has a lot of power, a lot of privilege, a lot of prestige, a lot of wealth. He's, one, he's the wealthiest Persian Empire leader. His father, Darius the Great, had built this empire, and Xerxes expands this empire, and it goes all the way from India over to northern Africa. I mean, it's a huge empire. Tons of people in his army. He's invading left and right. He's best known as for invading Greece. But he is somebody who is not just in this story. We see that he's somebody, in spite of his distance from God, we don't have any record of him worshiping God. We see a couple of instances 
where the Lord used situations to draw this man to make decisions that would, in one case, endanger the people of God, but in the ultimate case, save the people of God. In this story in the book of Esther, we find out it doesn't even start by talking about God or the Hebrews. It just starts off in the first chapter talking about this king, Ahasuerus. He throws a banquet, a party. And like most kings who are far from God, this party was wild. I mean, it was nuts. Six months long, we're talking about every pleasure you can imagine. Some of those things were awful and rowdy and raucous. And then at the end of the six months, there's a two-week after party. And this is where things get really crazy. And he's so drunk that he says, man, I'm going to bring out my wife Vashti and I'm going to show her off and I'm going to show everybody that she is mine. She's like my possession. And he just wants to use her as a trophy. And he calls for his queen Vashti and she has had it. I don't know if it's this party or all the parties combined, but she's done. She's like, no, I'm not your plaything. I'm not your toy. I'm not going to come parade myself around your bros. I'm not getting into that. And she says, no. And now he's embarrassed. And so he banishes her, kicks her out, says she is no longer the queen. And his elders come before him, and they're like, man, you better let the ladies in this land know. They better not step to their husbands. I mean, it's all kinds of issues going on in this story, Uh, women being belittled. And if we're honest, the story we were told as kids about Esther is not really what went down. Like, it's rough. This is not the bachelorette or the bachelor. Esther didn't have a choice here. She's a beautiful young lady who is in bondage, by the way, all right? So the people of God are in captivity. They've been taken over by the Babylonians and the Medes and Persians come in. Now they're they're in the diaspora. They are far from Jerusalem. They don't have their own freedoms. They're living in this kingdom. They're a small percentage of the population. Uh, They are often unliked and unfavored. And Esther is beautiful. And the king, he wants a new wife, so he starts putting out the word, bring all the beautiful maidens in. It wasn't like they said, hey, enter if you'd like. She's pulled in, and when she goes to see the king that night, like, it's not a, hey, I want to be here, don't want to be here. It's your life or not. And so the story really gets into some deeper issues here about the freedom of women, uh, the way that men were using women, and in spite of all of this, Esther and her cousin Mordecai, they were Hebrews. Not everybody knew that. Everybody knew that Mordecai was a Hebrew, and it's kind of funny. This story is really good at using language and how people use language. So when Ahasuerus would talk about Mordecai, uh, he would say, Mordecai, the Hebrew. And when Haman would talk about Mordecai, he would say, that Hebrew, Mordecai. Man, same words, but the words carry weight. And so this story is really, really good, and I want to share with you what happens. So the king is looking for a new bride, and he puts the word out, bring all the young maidens, and they bring in these virgins, man, thousands of ladies. And he starts picking through them and weeding through them, and Esther, she begins to realize that this is something that may, in the long run, help her and maybe help others. Who knows? So she talks to the eunuch, and a eunuch, I'm just going to be blunt with you guys, a eunuch was not something you or I are ever going to come into contact with more than likely. Uh, A king, when he had a temple and a palace, and he had all of these ladies in his harem, and all of these wives, and all of these ladies that he was using, basically, for physical pleasure, he didn't want any other studs in the room. He didn't want any other men to get any ideas. So eunuchs were men who had been men dehumanized, if you will. I mean, they had had that removed from them. And they lived and served in the king's palace in a rough way. I mean, it was not probably a life they chose. Most of them, this was forced on them. But these eunuchs, they served inside the palace. And so Esther went to the eunuchs and she said, hey, listen, what should I do here? And so the king, he would offer little tests. He would say, if I gave you anything, what would you want? And so she knows that she's going to get the opportunity, man, to have her request granted. And so she talks with the eunuch about what's the best plan for me to respond to this question. And I always think, man, what would I do if somebody with power, with prestige, with money offered me anything and everything, knowing it's a test, what would be my answer? And the eunuchs gave her wise counsel, told her how to answer the king and how to talk to the king. I'm not going to jump in there. This is in chapter two. In chapter, at the end of chapter two, something crazy happens. Mordecai, her cousin, the Bible says he's hanging around outside the temple gate or outside the palace gate. He was working for the government. He had a good job, all right? He was employed by the king. He wasn't close to the king. He lived outside the the palace. But one day he hears some people plotting to kill the king. Like he hears them talking about how they are going to kill the king. And that's important because actually this guy, Xerxes, the Hazarus, he dies one day because somebody kills him. Like a plot actually goes through. But in this case, Mordecai hears the plot 
and alerts the, the, the guards at the palace and says, you got to stop this. And man, everybody is thankful and a hazardous life is saved, but they never actually do anything for Mordecai. That happens in chapter 2. But then in chapter 3, we are introduced to this guy named Haman. And Haman has a line that we can trace back to that King Saul. So King Saul was told by God to go in and to kill this, this group of people who had been torturing and murdering people in the land. And he's told not just to like win the battle, but to kill their king and like to put it down, to end it. And he doesn't. Those people are who Haman traces his lineage to. That... Sinful disobedience by Saul leads to a man who is now going to have the power and the money to try to kill all of the Hebrew people, and we'll see that here in just a second. But it all starts when Haman is leaving, and he notices that everyone else bows down to him. Haman is a wealthy man. He has what is literally the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars, and he goes before the king. He's basically bought a seat at the table with the king. He's powerful. He's wealthy, and when he leaves, everybody's bowing down. They're taking a knee, but Mordecai doesn't. Mordecai, like a faithful Hebrew, knows we only worship God, and so he says, I'm not going to do that, and Haman sees all these people bowing down, and he takes note. That Mordecai, that Hebrew Mordecai, he isn't kneeling to me. And he begins to get it in his head that that is a guy who needs to have his life ended. I need to kill him. And he begins plotting not just to kill Mordecai, but how to kill all the Jews. He doesn't want everybody to see how insignificant and small he is, how petty he is. He doesn't want to just kill one person. He says, I'll just kill everybody and no one will know it was over something so stupid and small as not bowing, as not kneeling. And you say, Mark, that's an overreaction. I would tell you over and over throughout human history, this is how people act. When one person offends them, they don't just hurt them, they want to hurt everyone around them. And it's a small percentage of the people in the Persian Empire, and in Haman's mind, I can get rid of them. And so he actually goes to the king, and as is often the case, he brings a large law that not many people understand the wording of, and he pays what is the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars today to have a law passed, and snuck in there is a date a date a few months out, when on that date, everyone in the Persian Empire will not only be free, but encouraged to kill their Hebrew neighbor and take their possessions. And if you don't, you will be considered to be a Hebrew. And so it's kind of this built-in little section of the law where he's going to have all of the Hebrews wiped out. And in his mind, who cares about the Hebrews? I'm getting rid of Mordecai. Now, Haman and Ahasuerus don't realize that Mordecai isn't the only Hebrew in the king's court. Esther, the new queen, is a Hebrew. She hasn't disclosed that. Maybe nobody's asked her that. And so Mordecai hears about this plan, and he enters into sackcloth and ashes. He begins mourning. And when you're in sackcloth and ashes, it's a physical grieving, and he wasn't allowed in the king's court. The king didn't want to see people who were unhappy, upset. And so Esther sends word through her eunuch to some other eunuchs and like, I want you to see a couple of things. The eunuchs are going to be instrumental in this story. And she gets word back from Mordecai. And Mordecai says, Esther, we have a problem. Your king has signed a law that's going to kill everyone. All the Hebrews. We're going to get banished. We're going to get murdered. We're going to get robbed. It's going to be terrible. And Esther says, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I can do. And Mordecai says, Esther, you need to do what's right. You need to step up because, man, you've been put into a position and I want to read to you these key verses in Esther chapter 4, uh, verses 13 uh, through 16. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. He says, Don't you fool yourself into thinking you're going to get out and everyone else is going to suffer. He said, any more than all the other Jews, verse 14, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance, this is a little bit of faith in Mordecai's part, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther, verse 15, told them to reply to Mordecai, in verse 16, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. She says, you guys need to fast. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I, will, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, 
though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She says, listen, Mordecai, you know the rules. I don't have much power. I'm not the weakest woman in the kingdom, but if I go before the king without being summoned, he can kill me. And that seems brash, but man, that is how things worked back then. And it is, it is terrible to think that people devalued human life to the point that people were killed that quickly. But many people had gone before the king unsummoned and had been killed. But here's where we get a little, a little insight into what's going on in Esther's head. You and I know that that's the queen. That's her husband. Now, is he a perfect dude? Is he a great dude? Probably not. But we have every reason to believe he's going to hear her. But Esther has allowed fear to convince her that she doesn't have a platform, that she doesn't have power, that she doesn't have the ability or the right to speak up for what's right, to do what's right, and to defend God's people. And so they fast for three days, and she goes before the king. I want to give you a little bit of the rest of the story, and then I want to close with what this means for me and you. She goes before the king, and she says, King... I have her, she, she doesn't really go before him. She kind of walks near him, right? We've all done that. We want somebody's attention. We just walk by them. And he says, Esther, what do you need? And she comes before him. She says, King, I want you to come to a party. I'm going to throw a banquet just for us. And uh, as a matter of fact, why don't you, uh, why don't you bring that, that Haman guy as well? And Haman gets real excited. And, man, he wants to be there. He's pumped about this party that he's been invited to. He goes home and tells his wife that, man, he's been invited to this, this banquet that only, only he and the king and the queen are going to go to. And this first banquet, it happens in chapter 5, and uh, Esther spends some time talking to the king, and she kind of prepares the soil and, and gets ready for her request of him, but she doesn't, like, deliver everything yet. And at the end of the banquet, uh, Haman goes home that night, and he is pumped. He's telling his wife, and his wife is like, man, look at you. And then he says, but yeah, but oh, that Mordecai, the Hebrew, he is just, he is still on my nerves. And Haman has all of this to gain, but he wants so bad to kill Mordecai. And so his wife says, why don't you, why don't you do something? You know what make you feel better? Why don't you build a big gallows? And so Haman builds what is like a 75-foot tall gallows so that when he kills Mordecai publicly, like people for miles could see it. And he's like, man, this is great. I'm going to kill this dude, and everybody's going to see it, and it's going to be awesome. He's just so wicked and hate-filled. And he knows there's another banquet that the king and the queen are going to have. But that night, while he's telling his wife all about how great he is and the banquet he's been invited to, the king can't sleep. And this is where we find some providential intervention. The king is suffering from insomnia, and when he can't sleep, he has stories of his life read to him. Now, before you jump on him and say, man, that's super self-centered, I want to remind you that this is kind of what a lot of us do when we can't sleep. For instance, when I can't sleep, what I'll do a lot of times, I'll play music, and I'll go to my photos, and I'll scroll back a few years. I'll try to find some memories, some highlights, like, oh, man, remember when we were doing that? And I'll think back to some good days, man, some memories maybe I've forgotten. And that's really what Ahasuerus is doing. Xerxes, Ahasuerus, he is listening to stories of yesteryear, trying to remember how good it was. Maybe he's got some things stressing him out. And wouldn't you know it, the eunuchs start reading the story of how Mordecai had saved his life. The king wakes up. He's, he's kind of, whoa, 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 what? This guy saved my life? He told about a plot against me and he, he rescued me? They're like, yeah. And he said, what was done for him? Go, go to the record. And the guys, they start, nothing. Nothing was done for this guy. The king says, that will not stand. You know what? We're going to fix this tomorrow. The Bible tells us the next morning that Haman enters to talk to the king. And the king asks him this question. He says, Haman, suppose the king had somebody he really wanted to honor and bless and just celebrate well. What would that person want? And Haman thinks, this is such a good story. Haman thinks the king is talking about him. So Haman's like, man, what would I want? He says, king, that man, you should have him paraded through town on your horse, a horse that you have ridden, like a good horse. You should have someone walk with him saying, this man is blessed. This man is good. This is a hero. The king loves this man. And Haman's like, this is going to be great. I, I mean, I thought it was good that I was going to get invited to this bank. I thought it was great that I was going to build these gallows and kill Mordecai. Now I'm going to be celebrated. And the king says, Haman, that's a great idea. Here's what I want you to do. And Haman's like, absolutely, absolutely. He says, Haman, go get that horse and go find Mordecai, the Hebrew. 
Put him on that horse, man. He saved my life. And if you don't mind, Haman, would you, would you mind being the guy who walks through town and like, because every, look, Haman, everybody knows you and respects you. So if you say it, it'll really feel like it means something. And Haman, man, he is shell-shocked. He can't believe what he's just heard. He is bro- oh, he is broken. He can't believe how this is turning out for him. And he's instructed in chapter 6 to honor Mordecai. I think this is the moment when his family and those people around him begin to realize, like, Haman, you might be doomed. This, this law you had passed may come back to get you. You thought you had it figured out. The king and Haman are going to attend one more banquet that Esther is going to throw. This is her second banquet. This all happens in the course of 48 hours. This has actually been building for about five years. For five years, Haman has been hating on Mordecai. For five years, Esther has been the queen. And for the first two years, she's becoming the queen. She was in the harem. Now she's the queen. And God is building this thing, and it's going to come to a head. And in 48 hours, the course of history is going to transform. Everything's going to turn on its head in 48 hours. I want you to picture it now. You're a Hebrew. You're in bondage. You've already lost your freedom. You're in another another, uh, part of the world where they don't speak your language. Man, you are belittled look down on, and now you hear in a couple of months, you're going to be murdered and your stuff's going to be taken. It could not get bleaker, but in the matter of 48 hours, everything's going to turn around, and here's what happens. Haman and the king attend the banquet of the king, uh, the queen, the second banquet. Esther looks at the king with Haman sitting there and says, king, somebody has determined to kill me. And the king says, who would dare? And Esther says, they haven't just determined to kill me, they have determined to kill my people. And that's when she reveals that she is a Hebrew, one of the chosen people of God. And the king says, who would do such a thing? And you can almost see Esther saying, that guy right there sitting next to us. And Haman, man, he can feel it. The deal is done. It's over. He's freaking out. The king gets so mad, he leaves the room, all right? He knows he's about to do something in rage. He, he just leaves the room as quickly as possible. Haman and Esther are left alone in a room. Haman gets so distraught that he, he begins to get on his knees and plead for Esther. And he, he's begging her and he's getting a little clingy and he's touching her too much. And like the Bible says that when the king walks back in the room, Haman has his hands on Esther on her couch. Like it doesn't look good for Haman. And Ahasuerus King Xerxes says, it's not enough for you to kill her people, for you to kill my wife. Now you would ravage her in my own palace while I'm here. And this is the beautiful, like, the irony. I told you those eunuchs are going to come into play. Now, there were eunuchs in the room, but they keep silent. One of them pipes up and says, King, there's a gallows. This Haman has built not far from here. If I were you, I'd use that to kill him. The eunuch inserts this little bit of info. He doesn't lead him there. He's just like, hey, the, the king, uh, Haman did build a gallows. I think he was going to kill Mordecai. The guy that saved your life. Whatever you want to do with that information. And of course, the very gallows that Haman had built to kill Mordecai, he was hanging from them within hours. He's dead. It's over. Now, here's the problem. There's still a law that's been passed enabling people to kill and rob the Hebrews. So Mordecai begins to meet with the king, and they come up with a plan, a counter law, a counter decree. And what they do is they get this, the king to sign into law that on that date, not only will you not be encouraged, here, here's really the issue, this is not 2020. There, it wasn't like the king could send a tweet or an email or it could be on the news the next day. It takes months for this news to travel in a kingdom this large. So what they had to do is pass something that was as loud and large a law as the law that had been passed. And they didn't want people to think that they would be looked down upon for not following the first law. So they pass a second law that not only says this is not a good thing to do, but every Hebrew has every right to defend themselves to the death. They can kill anyone who comes into their house and tries to rob them. And and they kind of flip the law on its head. And the day comes a few months later, and it goes from being a day of destruction to a day of deliverance. And to this day, the Hebrews, they celebrate this with a party and a a a get-together where they honor the day of deliverance, and uh, it is to this day a festival to the Hebrew people. Now, that story took five years to get to two days, and then a few months later, 
the law is passed. I want you to see a couple of things that God did through everyday people, through eunuchs, and yes, through kings and people with power and privilege. I want you to see a couple of things. Number one, I want, you to, I want to remind you that God moves in the heart of the powerful. Sometimes we think that God is not capable of moving the hearts of the powerful in this world. We get scared or concerned about this leader or that leader or this individual and their intentions. And we see here through insomnia, we see here through God bringing the right person in at the right time, that God always has a way to move in the hearts of the powerful people in this world. God can move even in the most wicked of hearts to accomplish his purpose. I also want you to see that God enjoys using everyday people. Esther was not born into wealth. She was not born into privilege or power. As a matter of fact, you take it a step further, those eunuchs, they didn't have a whole lot to offer, but they played key roles through messaging, through helping Esther become the queen, and then ultimately through Haman uh, and his defeat, these eunuchs played a role. But then ultimately, this is the main truth I want you to take away this morning. God doesn't just bless us for our sake. God's intention was not just to let Esther have wealth and privilege and power, be married to the wealthiest man on the planet at that time. It was not about just Esther having a good life. Some of us have bought into this lie that life is all about us, that it's all about us. And every blessing we receive from God, every good gift we receive from God, it's about us and us only. And God just wants what's best for me. And God just wants me to feel good all the time. I would remind you that this story is so much bigger than Esther. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people who are blessed because of Esther's position that God elevated her to. God's people weren't just preserved for history's sake either. It wasn't just that God wanted to save Esther so that he could save the people. I would remind you that it's through the people of God, these Hebrew children, when they would come back from bondage, they would be in Jerusalem. They would, it was through them that a Savior would be born. Our blessings, our gifts are never just about us. They're ju never just about our posterity or our history. They're about a bigger story than we could ever see or bigger, be a part of because a Savior needed to be born to the world. So for months, the Hebrew people may have thought, we are going to be wiped off the, the face of the earth, but God had made promises that would not allow that to happen. And he elevated a young lady who was no lady of privilege, and back then no women had power. Even as the, second most pow even as the wife of the most powerful, most, most powerful man in the world, she had little power compared to the men around her. This is why she was afraid to go before the king. So I want to kind of close this morning with three responses that you and I should have to times like these. The question becomes, what do we do when we don't know what to do? What do we do when the world's falling apart? What do we do when we see so much unrest, so much injustice, so much brokenness around us, and everyone around us is hurting, and we say to ourselves, I can't do anything. We feel helpless. We feel like there's nothing that can be done. Esther is the queen. She is powerful, has a platform, and what does she say? I don't even know what I could do. Esther had all of this privileged platform and power, and yet even she was nervous. So it's natural for you, when you look at the world around you, when you look at the hurt, the brokenness, for you to say, who am I, what could I do? I want to encourage you in three ways this morning. Number one, I want you to know that you and I can make a difference with our lives. Whether you have power, wealth, talent, or not, God can and he desires to use us. Your influence and abilities are greater than you may think. My encouragement to you, first of all, is do not believe the lie that you don't matter and you can't make a difference. For some reason, something had entered into Esther's head and told her, you don't matter, the king doesn't like you, he won't listen to you, he may kill you, you can't save the people, you can't do anything. When you and I are reading the story, we're like, you're the queen. You're a Hebrew. You're the only one who can do something. Mordecai says, Esther, you got to do something. If you don't, God will raise up something else. But listen, you should speak up. So listen to me. When you're watching this right now and you say, Mark, I'd love to make a difference, but who am I? I want to remind you, you have influence. You have a platform. This woman has all of this power and platform, and somebody had to encourage her to use it. I want you to hear me say this and hear me say this loud. Somebody is watching. 
watching you. Somebody is listening to you. I was meeting with a, an individual in our church this week. Me and some of our leaders met with a young lady. She was saved last year, baptized, and man, she's been growing in the Lord. And she said, man, I just feel like God wants to use me, and I'm not sure what that looks like. And so she said, you know what I've been doing? I've just been praying, reading my Bible twice a day, and I'll get on Facebook Live, and I'll just share what God's doing in my life. I'll just use the platform God has given me right now. I want you to hear me say this, y'all. The church needs Christians who are activated and encouraged to use the platform they have right now. Some of you have friends who will never watch a live stream of a church. They will never come with you to church, but they'll listen to you, you describe what Jesus has done in your life. Esther needed somebody to encourage her to use her platform. So number one, I want you to hear me. You can make a difference. Number two, you need to hear this. My gifts and blessings are not about me. And that's hard because every one of us have pride and ego and we realize we're good at something. We're like, yeah, look what I can do. I want to remind you though, God doesn't just bless us and gift us so that we can enjoy these blessings and gifts. God always gives us a blessing or a gift to be used for a purpose. In Colossians 2.10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before you were ever born, God had a plan for your life, and he gifted you and equipped you. Equipped you. Now, whether you use those or not, man, you've got this thing called free will, and some of you, you just refuse to use your gifts, but God's gifted you and equipped you that you should walk in good works which were prepared beforehand. You can make a difference. You are equipped and you are gifted, not for yourself, but for others. And then number three, you need to hear this. God is at work even when you don't feel or see it. God is not mentioned by name in the book of Esther. Mordecai, Esther, the Hebrew diaspora, they mourn. They're afraid, but even when it seems like God is far away, God is moving, and God is opening a door of escape. Now, they're in bondage for sin. God has allowed judgment to enter in the hands of the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians. I mean, God has dealt with sin, but God is still watching over his children, protecting them. God's working. The story that we read got way worse before it got better. At the beginning of the story, it's just a crazy king. They're in bondage. Then it gets worse. There's annihilation. There's threats of death, murder, and robbery. And ultimately, genocide is on the table. The story got worse before it got better. But then we see what Mordecai said. Maybe you've come into the kingdom for such a time. Is this. If you keep silent, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews. There's this faith in his voice. He says, Esther, I don't know, but maybe, just maybe, you are where you are for a purpose. Whether or not you speak up, I believe deliverance will come. All through this story, we see that Mordecai has faith. He's a little bit older. He's seen some things. He's lived through some things. I want you to hear me say this, church. God is at work when we don't see it, when we don't feel it. Over the last few months, it's been very difficult for our church to operate, to gather for worship, and ultimately, some of the things we love celebrating, we haven't gotten to see. It's very rare for our church in a 90-day course not to see somebody saved, somebody baptized, to see first-time guests at church who some of them are reconnecting to the church for the first time in years. These are things we love to see, and we haven't gotten to see that. Some of the things we love celebrating, we haven't gotten to do. But it's crazy. I've been talking with some of our leaders, been talking with some of our staff, and God is actually working in our small groups right now. There are people who are growing. I mentioned a young lady we met with this week. There are literally dozens of people in our church who through this season, God is doing something in their life. Now, you or I don't get to see it. We may not get to feel it because we're not in the worship service where we're all together and we hear each other's voices, but God is still at work. I would remind you that most of our brothers and sisters around the world don't get to worship as freely as we often do. There are certainly brothers and sisters in persecution and under threat of execution in certain parts of the world. They never get to worship the way that we enjoyed so freely for so long. So yes, God is at work. God is moving. And here's how God works and here's how God moves, through his people. 
In this story, it was Mordecai encouraging, nudging. It was Esther speaking up. And here's what I want you to understand. God doesn't just work and move like he does behind the scenes stuff and we all just coast along. God uses his people. Last week, he used his people at our church to serve, homeless, to serve meals to the homeless at Oasis on a Sunday afternoon. This week, Mercy Drops came and got some food. Why? Because God works in mysterious ways? No, God works often in the same ways. He uses his people's generosity to bless the community. He uses personal invitations to see people come to church, to see people respond in faith to an invitation to accept Jesus. It's always been the same story. God works in very similar ways. Yes, there are these mysterious ways. Yes, there are miracles in the New Testament. But here's the greatest miracle that you or I will most likely ever be a part of. When you invite someone to church, when you share your faith with somebody, when you encourage a neighbor, when God uses you to reach somebody that someone else has been praying for and crying over and reaching out to, this is the miracle of being part of God's church. Mordecai did his part. Esther did her part. And God was at work all along the way. So in a story like this, it's really easy to say, man, I want to be like Esther, or to say, man, if I was Esther, I would do that. I want you this morning, instead of focusing on all the, pr- the, the privilege, the power, the potential that Esther had, I want you to consider your life. No, you are not probably married to the wealthiest king on the planet right now. But you do live in a very different time than Esther did. You have a lot more freedom than she enjoyed. You do. No one is threatening your life when you speak truth. Her life was under threat of death. When you communicate online, you have the potential to reach dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. The reason their law took so long to correct was because it took so long to communicate. That's not the case anymore. Before you get caught up in all the potential that Esther and Mordecai had, I want to remind you that you have potential. That God has created us, knowing we'd be living in such a time as this. Esther lived in a time where God knew the issue, the king, the story, the Haman, the, all the stuff. And yet, he allowed you and I to live in a time like this. When our neighbors are scared, the world is in disarray, and we'll be tempted, if we're not careful, to just respond like everybody else. Some of us have chosen a side based on our politics. Some of us have chosen a side because we like fighting or arguing with people. The church should never be able to fit into a box of this policy or that policy or politics. We should be an anomaly. It should blow people's minds that we believe all lives are precious not just the life of the unborn, not just the life that was snuffed out by an officer. We should never fit neatly into a box because God's people are not an organization. We're a living, breathing body. And when the world vies for power, or prestige, or privilege, or wealth, we say that's not what it's about. We know that sometimes loving our neighbor will result in us getting hurt. We know that turning the other cheek is not always easy. The gospel is so powerful when lived out, it should make us what the Bible calls salt and light in a dark world. We are different. We don't fit in. We're just not like everybody else. Because truly, if the faith could fit into a box neatly, if the faith were just another policy or another platform, What good is it? The gospel of Jesus is so much more than what many of us enjoy getting divided over. Esther used her voice to speak up for what was right, and lives were saved. You and I have the opportunity to make a difference, to use our gifts and blessings, and to see God at work. It's up to us to speak up, to do our part. Could I pray that over you as we finish up the service this morning. Jesus, I believe that you have gifted our church, our body, our people. Some are gifted with the way they talk. I've met with some of our leaders this week and they are just gifted communicators. Some of them are good in a small group setting. Some of them are good on a stage setting. Some of them are just really good at talking to people where they are, counseling them through hurt and pain. 
Lord, we've also got some individuals in our church. They're not so much the talking type, but Lord, they are the encouragers, the prayer warriors, the people who are there to support others. They get there early. They stay late. They are behind the scenes and love every minute of it. Jesus, I believe that you've equipped and gifted our church uniquely, not just so that we can have a church, not so that we can just be another church that we get together and worship. God, you've equipped and gifted us, not just for us, but for those around us, to be a blessing to the needs of our community, to see lost people saved, to see homes and families that are broken restored. God, you have gifted us, not just for us, not so we can get together and say, man, that was some good church, not just so we can get together and say, look at how gifted and talented our people are. Lord, you've given us these gifts and blessings so that we can pour them out pour them into good works you've already prepared for us to do. So God, I pray for open eyes and open ears. Let us listen up for the opportunity to be a blessing and to use our gifts and our equipping and our our blessings, Lord, to do more than we ever thought. Let us not buy into the lie that, well, if I was really wealthy, I would be a blessing because I'd be generous. Well, if I was really gifted, I'd speak up, I'd say stuff, I'd do stuff. Lord, every one of us, we are blessed, we are gifted. Use us pray that you would do that. You'd stir up within us the gift as Paul talked about with Timothy. God, help us to be encouraged like Esther was by Mordecai, to speak up, to do right, to intervene. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I know that this is different. It's, we're all getting used to it. My open prayer is that I'll get to see you in two weeks, weather permitting, and, uh, Next week is Father's Day. I hope you get an opportunity or a chance to honor your dad, call your dad, and uh, we're going to do our best to honor the dads in our church next week on church at church online. Um, uh, I want to just take a minute to remind you if you have a prayer request or praise item, you can click the link in the description. Our kids' lessons are there too. If you've got teenagers, our student group gets together online now. All those links are in the description of this video. And if you'd like to give this morning, that is also in the link on the video. You can also give via text. All that information is displayed as well. And uh, church, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, our leaders, our staff. Like it makes it so much easier. You've been faithful in giving, so we haven't had to make any hard decisions. We're doing church online to protect you. Uh, I know I know there are churches that have felt pressured to get back to meeting in person because their offerings have struggled and suffered. Thank you for not letting that be a reason we make decisions around here. Uh, we have actually been able to give more to benevolence and to our community needs because of your faithfulness. So thank you, thank you, thank you, church. Um, if you have uh, a need this morning, we want you to reach out. If you're part of our church, we're gonna do everything we can for you. Maybe you just feel alone. There is a group for you. Our groups are meeting. Some are meeting online. Some are meeting online and in person. Some are meeting in person. You can find all that in the link in the description or go to restore.church slash groups. Church, another week in the books means we're a week closer to getting together. And weather permitting, I hope to see you on June 28th. So here's what we're going to pray. We're going to pray for good weather. And here's what I mean by that. I don't just pray it doesn't rain. I'm praying for cool weather. Low humidity, right? Low temperature. I'd love to wear a jacket if possible on June 28th. You guys have a fantastic afternoon. We love you. We're praying for you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.